Ah, the carbon, or the carbon, as French people will never call it, um, is where things start to get serious in terms of premium, refined aesthetics, and, and well, um, hammer heavy specs. Today, we are reviewing the excellent MPG X870 e carbon Wi-Fi, the massive, the gorgeous, the heavy board here to remind you that you'd rather be watching one of my reviews instead of investing real time in real people in the real world. Wow, that, that was uh, a bit dark. Sorry about that. Now, starting with the obvious. The X870 He Carbon comes with a rather thick and durable eight-layered ATX PCB. That, that's going to matter in, in terms of componentry signal interferences, as well as safely operating any PCIe standards above 3.0. So the bones of the carbons are good and thick. Design-wise, the carbon will show more textures than you'll see on the lower tier board uh, like Tomahawk. There is more reflective areas which do render deeper contrast with its uh, surrounding metal. It remains angular but shows a more precise cut giving that more tech-inspired feel rather than the usual aggressive military one. The finish is all brushed metal, resulting in a very satisfactory and fine grainy touch. It is by far the best looking carbon I have seen coming out of MSI assembling line. RGB-wise, the carbon remains sober with no tacky embedded RGB LEDs. We do, however, have a very nice backlitted Dragon logo on the VRM roof and a very premium carbon backlitted print on the M.2 Solid State Drive back plate. Talking of which, I, I absolutely love how MSI uh, found a way to power that light through a magnetic plug instead of some annoying uh, cabling. And if that is not enough lighting uh, for your late night pleasure gaming sessions, you have four RGB connectors here to articulate every bit and corners of your soul. CPU socket wise, well, we are in luck since AMD decided to stay with its AM5 CPU socket for another season. So uh, you're back compatible to your 7000 series and no expensive RAM upgrade this year. Chipset wise, well, this is where a lot of the attention will go. Our new X870 e chipset is made of a Tandem ProMod 21 chips, which is not the only thing it has in common with its X670 e predecessors, because uh, to be absolutely honest with you, they are identical in terms of specs or almost so. Whatever the X670 e powered motherboard could do, your X870 e motherboard will uh, will do as well. As a whole, when I'm going to be reviewing X870 e-powered motherboard, specs will be very similar to last year uh, uh, models and all the, how to say, the incentive, the upgrade incentive will therefore rest on what manufacturers came up with in terms of you know, innovation, uh, new features and stuff like that. It's not going to be coming from AMD here. Now, VRM wise, well, we got a severe upgrade. The X870 e Carbon now features 21 110 amps power stages organized in an 18 plus two plus one direct phases. That is 2310 amps worth of juice to power this 2,000 of which are CPU centric. That is a 15% jump of power when compared to the carbon last year, which was already a lot. And, and some might say even overkill considering the fact that the new Ryzen 9000 series is far more uh, power efficient. Meaning that last year VRM would now be even more overkill with the current generation of processors. But on the good side, it is, well, future proofed for quite a bit because uh, uh, AM5 CPU socket is going to be uh, around until 2027. So at least a couple more of Ryzen processors, which most likely will be much more, you know, power hungry and, and, and you know, will maybe necessitate something like that. So yeah, uh, future proofing, very good. Now, as in any carbon, the cooling blocks are a masterclass of what premium cooling blocks should be. We got a two-stage segment attached by an 8mm wide pipe for a more homogeneous heat spread, 
among them too. And they do have several winglets uh, around them to brass more air. A special note to the main block, which probably has the thickest uninterrupted block of aluminium I have ever seen on a board. I do need to point out how good and moist and fresh the thermal pads are. They are both in direct contact with trucks and power stages alike, and that's just grand in terms of thermal relief. Results are, well, exactly what you would expect. With a 7900X clocked at 5.4 GHz, and with a 100% synthetic load, the X870 He Carbon VRM remains at a very calm 55 degrees Celsius for the most of its 60 minutes stress test. The block's temperature steadily increases and plateaus around the 25th minute mark, at which point the block expels about the same amount of heat than it harvests. In short, you can overclock your heart out on any compatible processors, including uh, uh, the ones coming next year and the one after. So, a beautiful VRM. I would not expect this board to be paired with anything else than a Ryzen 7 at a minimum and giving it an easy 8.5 out of 10 uh, in terms of scoring. Now, RAM-wise, the X870 He Carbon can support 256GB of DDR5 RAM organized in a dual-channel configuration with a maximal single stick clock of 8.4 GHz, which I achieved on a, a, a Dominator stick. And that's a first for me because usually when my other board says you can reach 8.2, 8.4 GHz, I really go beyond 7.5, 7.6, which is, don't, don't, don't get me wrong, it's really very high. This is the first motherboard who allowed me to reach 8 gigahertz stably, stably. so uh, yeah, uh, a, a very good point for the carbon. Now, uh, in terms of comparison, that's 600 megahertz more than the previous carbon, and despite the number, it doesn't mean much in terms of gaming, but does start to make a slight difference in memory-centric operations such as video rendering, so great for uh, uh, production setups. Staying in the memory, we have the exact same configuration we had seen on the X670E carbon, meaning two 128 gigabit fast PCI 5.0 CPU fed sticks and two 64 gigabit uh, uh, per second, still plenty fast chipset fed PCI 4.0 sticks. We got floor paddings for all of our sticks, in addition, obviously, of the thermal pads present on the heat blocks, which, by the way, are really, really thick. Quite a bit more than seen last year. Now, where different starts to peak is on the screwless mechanism, which seems to be a bit more robust and sturdy uh, than last year's model. And finally, all of our heat plates can be removed and placed back with a simple push on a latch. No more screws anywhere. Finally, a real DIY focus and effort coming from MSI. It's not that hard. I've been, I've been waiting for this for, for at least a couple of years and, and finally it's here. I would be amiss not to mention the presence of our four SATA 3 plugs here to support our legacy drives. Export-wise, well, we have the usual 316 slots PCIe exports, but with some noticeable changes. The first two are both CPU fed with PCI 5.0 lanes. Only the first one receives a full 16 lane treatment, so this is where you want your GPU placed for optimal performances. And it is also why only the main export is uh, featuring a GPU ejection mechanism, which, as we've seen on the last Tomahawk review, has received a lot of love. It's more sturdy and features a much needed permanent lock in mechanism to ensure an extra grip on those heavy uh, GPUs. And it is the first time I see it uh, on a carbon, so rather happy here. Now, the second one shows only four PCI 5.0 lanes, which is actually four lanes less than we had on the Carbon X670E last year. And there's a very simple and actually logic explanation for that. On one hand, neither the CPU or the chipset bring any additional PCIe 5.0 lanes when compared to what was available last year. And on the other hand, we do have the introduction of the USB 4.0 plugs and standard on our back IO. And those need 
four dedicated PCIe 5.0 lanes as well. So MSI removed four lanes from the second PCIe slot and dedicated them to the USB 4.0 uh, plugs on our back IO in order to avoid any kind of awkward PCIe bifurcation, which I do understand personally because there are so few people using a second GPU these days, but everyone wants to use, you know, their back IO full bandwidth. But now let's discuss the difficult part of this review, at least for me, because that's going to be a lot of graphics involved. Uh, we have, as in any uh, motherboard these days, some PCIe bifurcations because we don't have enough bandwidth to feed all of those export in the same time. To avoid a full bandwidth starvation around the system, MSI did the judicious move to have the two CPU fed exports and this M.2 solid state drive sharing bandwidth. To get the full 16 PCIe lanes on your GPU export, you need to make sure that both the second PCIe export and second M.2 solid state drive stay empty. If not, the main export will see its bandwidth reduced to 8 PCIe 5.0 lanes and the second export and M.2 solid state drive will share the removed bandwidth in a 4x4 PCIe 5.0 bifurcation. Again, I don't see this being a problem since we don't have uh, video cards on the market today which can surpass 8 PCIe 5.0 lanes probably starting January and that's going to be another discussion but as it is of today, if you have a 1490, it, it will not be able to uh, um, to bottleneck or to be, be bottlenecked by an 8-lane PCIe 5.0 standard. Now, back IO-wise, well, the most obvious thing here is the USB upgrades. We got a large menu of plugs, but most importantly, we have two new and dedicated USB 4 Type-C, which can output 40 gigabit per second worth of data swap each, that is a total of 150 gigabit per second of data output, a rather heavy upgrade when compared to the X670E model last year. Interestingly, our USB 4 doubles up as an integrated graphics output, which means that in addition of the HDMI port, our board can now support up to three dedicated screens. Connectivity wise, well, we have two LANs, including a five gigabit one and an upgraded Wi-Fi 7 dual band adapter, which more than double the Wi-Fi bandwidth we've been used to for about a decade. And most importantly, provides us a near zero wireless latency. And finally, we have our premium all digital Realtek ALC4080 cleansed by only 120 worth of microfarads capacitors, which is fine for USB fed codec. Overall, this is where MSI did the heaviest upgrade on this board. There is more bandwidth and MSI wants you to know it. This is not a back IO you usually see on a carbon. Uh, um, you need to go to the meg level, $800 uh, uh, motherboard to see that kind of bandwidth level. So obviously a big back IO kudos to MSI for this. Now front panel connector wise, well, we have our usual suspects, but what really got my attention is the additional eight pin power plug right here, which will increase our Type-C electrical output to 27 watts, meaning you can now fast charge your phone through your chassis front panel. It, it, it seems like a small thing, but I absolutely love it because I I do. I, I really do. I, I, I do. Now, most importantly, we do have something new and, and something I think will set MSI apart from its competition. The easy connector. Through one and only connector, you can now use and operate an entire all-in-one water cooling apparatus. It's power, the fans, the RGB, we got everything in one plug, allowing a streamlined setup approach and a much neater uh, cable management. These little innovations, this little evolution on the board, I see them here and there every year, and I can recognize the ones who actually going to make it through and bleed through the industry or just die out. And I think this one has a, a rather good shot at it. it. It might be sticking around longer than we think. Now, cooling wise, we have seven PWM fans, one of which can support a water pump, but in terms of custom water cooling features, I definitely would want MSI at carbon level to give us a little bit more flesh on that bone. Troubleshooting wise, now, uh, without surprises, the carbon delivers 
heavy. We have a bunch of physical buttons. On the back I.O. we got a clear CMOS, a flashback button, great for a CPU-less BIOS update, and even a programmable button which will do whatever you want it to do. Now on the board itself we have a big easy to see backlit power and reset buttons very handy. As troubleshooting goes, we have our first aid easy debugger and most importantly, an error screen uh, to help us refine our troubleshooting adventures. Solid from A to Z. And since we're on the topic, uh, I do want to also mention the bias. This year, uh, uh, MSI board X870 and X870 and everything was gonna go from here to B-Series and everything are coming with a brand new, not an updated, a brand new BIOS shell, which is breathe, breathe to my oxygen. I don't know what that means. Um, for the past five, six years, MSI had a very buggy, not very good uh, BIOS, I have to say it. This is finally something rock solid. They went back to zero, developed everything in house and gave us something we can actually really count on. So I'm very excited about this and I think maybe the biggest evolution of, of this year and also an incentive on its own to, to upgrade from previous MSI boards to this one. Now, in conclusion, the MPG X870 He Carbon will cost you about 500 bucks before taxes, which is about what its X670 E powered predecessor did cost. Now, the question is obviously, is it worth it? Is it worth the upgrade from the X670 to the X870 E? Quick answer, absolutely not. There is nothing the X670 E Carbon cannot do when compared to its newer version this year. And the second and more problematic question is, is there any differences or enough differences between the X870 Tomahawk, which I reviewed last month, and the X870 E Carbon here to warrant a $200 premium, a $200 differential between both boards. And in terms of performances, let me be clear, the Tomahawk will be able to do about or almost everything the carbon can do. What the carbon brings, which could warrant such a premium expenditure, is a more sturdy, two PCB layer, more sturdy product, a better equipped, stronger and future-proofed VRM. And well, we get a much, much better looking, better finished product than what the Tomahawk is. And uh, frankly talking, a much more comfortable product to, to, to build with and to use on a daily basis. So what you're looking at is a luxury product, which is fine. It's just fine. If you want a premium, good looking motherboard, this is where you want to put your money, obviously. But I would be more comfortable to see this carbon with a, a, a lower delta with a Tomahawk. So I would advise you a 425 to 450 buying price instead of the 500, which should not be too hard to find. In this condition, then obviously, then there would be nowhere else your money wants and needs to be.